morning. It's really nice to be in a conference again, um, and in Amsterdam in particular. Um, been working out of Oslo for the last couple of years, so it wasn't such a big flight this time. Um, so I want to talk, so my name is Fred George, as you can see from the slide. Um, as you can see from my hair, I've been doing this a really long time. Um, I wrote my first code in 1968, so I'm running around getting close to 55 years of doing this. Um, and it's still fun, so I keep doing it. So I want to talk about agile transformations and sort of how, you, how they're sabotaged. Um, so this is all, all from personal experiences. Um, I started doing Agile basically in 98 uh, in Java. Um, I come from a small talk background, so it wasn't such a big leap to go into Agile. But I've been, had a lot of successful deliveries. In fact, almost I would say every delivery I've had has been successful. We've got the code out the door on time, on budget. But I've got to say that the permanent transformations have been less successful. That a lot of times this stuff just hasn't stuck that you try to do. And I'm trying to keep going back to sort of realize what could I do differently to sort of get it to stick this time. And I've used a lot of different mitigation strategies, and I continue to try to find new ones as we go. But this presentation is about those saboteurs, those guys who basically try to screw it up. And I'm sorry to find sabotage is kind of the official definition is somebody who's actively trying to destroy what you're trying to accomplish. But I'll expand a little bit because there's also unintentional sabotage going on, that they're doing it in ignorance. And I'm going to talk about those effects as well because, frankly, the mitigation strategies work in both environments. So 13%. This is actually what McKinsey, a big consulting firm, says how efficient an Agile project is better than a normal project. It enhances by only 13%, which means why would you go to the trouble? On the other hand, you sort of see people like uh, Jeff Sutherland who says he's never had a project that wasn't four times better than the normal process. And the process projects I tend to work on, you know, 4x at least. So what's the difference between this 13% and 4x stuff? I mean, what, are, what is Jeff Sutherland doing and other people are doing that's so successful, yet McKinsey looks across the enterprise and finds out it's not so good? And I think a lot of it has to do with the things we do differently in our Agile projects. And a lot of it comes down to speed. We're running at an entirely different pace inside the development group. So we typically use this sort of tasking cycle. We talk about this when our training and then we actually execute it in real projects. We basically pick up a, a task, use some design. Yes, there is design in Agile. We write some tests first. We get the code working back and forth and back and forth. Then we integrate, make sure it works with everything else. And then pick up another task. And I sort of ask audiences, well, how, how long does it take you to go through one of these cycles? I was in India working on a million lines of code one time. It was the largest sun-certified application in the world. This is something you do not want to be. And so basically, you know, how long did it take to go around that cycle with a million lines of code with 50 programmers? It turned out two hours. Not weeks and months and days, but just two hours. So typically now, and we're much better than that now, typically you go around the cycle somewhere between 15 minutes and two hours. You go around the whole cycle and then do it again and do it again. The great thing about this is programmers are happy when they're co shipping code. That's what we get paid to do is write code. And we're doing that. But this speed cycle is really disruptive to the rest of the organization because of how fast a development team can react and how fast they can eat new requirements up. But there's something else going on here as well. And that is we're always ready to ship the code. So no longer is this sort of tail wagging the dog. No longer is it we're going to tell the business when they can have the code. You know, go, here, give me your requirements, go away, we'll come back later, we'll, I'm sure we'll have the code ready. Usually doesn't happen that way. But now we're in a state where we're constantly ready to ship. Shipping has now become a business decision. And frankly, they're not ready for it. They're used to throwing things over the wall and walking away. So this is creating stress in the organization. And this is when the saboteurs start to arise. So here's an example of sort of the impact to the organization. So for the last couple of years, uh, a few years ago, I was working with NAV, which is the Norwegian Welfare Association, um, the largest spender of tax money in Norway, and they have a lot of tax money. 
So they were tracking, and this presentation is from a colleague there. They were tracking how many deployments they have. So these are the top five projects in the graph they had. I did squeeze it down because I need the scale. But then, you know, the top project in 2018 shipped 135 times to deploy, deployed 135 times. Then you go back two more years, the total number is 14 for the enterprise, 14. So they're getting much better at that. Here's what it was in 2019. So the three start projects are the projects we apply these technologies to, these techniques to, in only the last four months of that year. In the last four months, we shipped 3,000 times, completely dwarfing anything they've seen before, using these sort of techniques. This is disruptive to the organization. So this is the source of the disruption. So who are the saboteurs? We're going to talk about different classes of saboteurs here. But who are sort of the active guys, the guys who are really trying to make it not work? Well, the first classification of these are the individuals who are losing power in this relationship. Losing power, losing prestige. So these are guys like, for example, the, the senior architect, where people used to him coming to the office and praying at his door, making sure he will approve something before they move on to the next stage. We're not waiting for them. We're moving forward very aggressively. Or the parents of full stack developers say, I can do the back end and the front end. Oh, no, no, I'm the front end developer. You just got to be the back end guy. No, but I can do both. Well, I don't want you to do both. We're going to do both anyway. New process. And then the people who are used to signing things off. I can't do this unless you get the sign offs. So I was working in a media company in London. I was interviewing for the job. I'm in the CTO's office, and somebody walks in with a piece of paper and have him sign it off. This was for some deployment. Now, he's looking, he didn't even look at this piece of paper. It's several pages long. But it's his permission to actually deploy the software. And I told him right there and there, I said, somebody ever brings me one of those, I'm taking it to the shredder. We're not going to wait for sign-offs. Another company in London, I was working in another company in London, we acquired another company. And the first thing we did with that other company was we find everybody who makes rules and enforces rules made them all redundant, got rid of them all. All those people that are signing things off, they're gone. They're not value added to the process. In fact, they stifle the innovation. These people do not want to see me coming. These are your act, this is active sabotage. Another one, this area is where you have sort of process impedance mismatch, where their process and my process do not align. My process is extremely fast, extremely aggressive. We're changing things all the time. We're making new decisions. We're changing our mind every day. Yet there are other organizations and other parts of the organization, other roles, that are used to having a much more waterfall world to, 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 to work with. I mean, most of the times it's the UX guys who say they've learned the process in school. They got to study the entire thing. They got to go do focus groups. They got to do all this other stuff. Then they're going to think about it for a while. And they're going to draw some pictures and wire it together perfectly. And then they're going to give it to developers. I'm not going to wait for that. This process cannot tolerate that sort of feedback cycle. So then you also your database guys who have to prove things and architecture boards and all these other approval processes. This is an impedance mismatch. This is a sabotage. Also, you have those who don't like to see you succeed. I mean, to some degree, there, there, there are people out there who say, well, it can't possibly work, and it's not the way we used to do things, and I, by the way, I'm your Java senior Java tech lead, and this is not the way I want to work. I'm sorry we're doing it anyway. But I'm, the, I'm a senior Java tech lead. I'm supposed to be doing it this way. So these people go in there and try to minimize your accomplishments. They say, oh, yeah, that works fine for that special environment, but the general environment is not going to work in. Of course it does. It does work. But they're out there saying, oh, no, 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 you, you're only working on web pipeline, or you know, you're only working in the back end. It's not going to work for the other things. You also have this sort of the, what I call the reverse Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect basically just says if you pay attention to a group of people and treat them special, they will overproduce. It's a great trick. I use it all the time. I'm perfectly happy with Hawthorne effects. It helps my success. But the people who are not in the room don't feel special. And in fact, will sort of say, by the way, why can't, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this sort of stuff? And then again, they're going to be jealous of your success, and they're going to try to minimize that activity. These are active sabotage efforts. 
So how do you mitigate this stuff? How do you keep this sort of stuff from happening? Or how do you sort of basically minimize the impact of these sort of you know, active saboteurs? Well, interesting enough, um, we use a strategy from Stalin. So this comes from uh, Roy Singham, who's the founder of ThoughtWorks. Um, actually, at one point, he was, in fact, the, the, the treasurer of the Communist Party of the United States. So we're talking about a pretty strange individual to start with. But who quotes Stalin, right? So basically, Stalin says, if you and I disagree, don't argue with you. That's useless. I'm not going to convince you. Talk to all the rest of you guys. And when all, you get, all the rest of you guys agree with me, we can shoot him. So you really want to avoid active confrontation in these in situations where somebody is coming after you, trying to irritate you. You want to avoid that confrontation. Instead, you just keep working with the people who agree with you, get more and more of those guys on board, and eventually this guy will realize he has no influence. So this comes from uh, Grunt, from basically a character in uh, Mass Effect 2, who basically says at one point very sagely, the greatest insult you can give to an enemy is ignore him. I'll guarantee you these guys who are trying to actually sabotage, when I refuse to engage with them, they get really pissed. Which is good. I'm happy they're pissed. I want them to be upset with themselves. Then they do stupid things. They say stupid things. Again, I'm going after the masses. I'm not trying to convince everybody. I can't do that. It's not going to be possible. So there's also the sandwich strategy. And this comes from the fact that, you know, working early in, in my ThoughtWorks career, um, had an engagement with a client, amazing result. Just I absolutely stunned the client what we accomplished. And never got any more work from that client. And I was been scratching my head after that. It says, why, they should be after us like crazy. They should want to bring this process and us back to do this again. But then you begin to think about what's really going on. There's some sort of, you know, product manager who was failing. That's what he brought in ThoughtWorks. We succeeded. Now, is he going to go run hell his CEO? By the way, we were failing miserably, and these guys saved me. No, he's going to pat us on the head, send us on our way, and just say, hey, I succeeded. He's not interested in telling him what went on. So we created the, what we call the sandwich strategy. And it starts out this way. So we're going to go find that executive. It's high up in the organization we can possibly reach. And we want to have a conversation with this guy about what is going to happen. We want to make him understand this is what's going to happen. So, and by the way, senior executives are smart, despite what we say about them. They are actually really smart. They didn't get there by accident. And if you tell them what's really going to happen, and they don't care about pair programming, they don't care about TDD or mobs and any of that other nonsense, what they care about is what you're creating on a cultural aspect. An extremely reactive team. They can change their mind about business. We can add members in and out of this team as you need to, based upon your priorities. They drool at this message. They understand what you're trying to accomplish. They could care less how it's happening, if you can make it true. So then you go down to the teams. Teams are easy to get excited. This is fun stuff. You're shipping code all the time. Uh, we're working with each other. We're solving problems together. This is fun. And then you got the guy in the middle. It could be a middle manager, it could be the architect, it could be the web services compliance guy, whoever it is. He sees what's going on. He's not a part of that. He's one of those saboteurs. So, of course, what he does is he runs up to the executive and says, Executive, hey, do you realize what these guys are doing down there? The executive says, yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it is pretty cool. And then he runs back to his office and hides. These guys in the middle are risk averse. Kent Beck has tried for years and years to come up with various techniques to give us these guys in the middle. Agile is a good idea. He's almost universally failed. You can't convince these risk averse managers to put something at risk here. They don't want to take that chance. So ignore them. Get the guy at the top. Top sandwich, bottom sandwich, the stuff in the middle, irrelevant. But you've got to get both sides up there because those guys will run up to see that executive. So the sandwich strategy, a key part of our mitigation. The other trick is if you've got a team that's not working well, if somebody's sort of actively inhibiting you, like that senior Java developer who still wants to do it the old-fashioned way and doesn't like these newfangled things we're talking about, then basically just throw somebody else in the team who's really competent. 
And the other team starts looking to this guy because he's competent. And he's willing to work in this style. So again, an experience we had in India. We hired a very experienced Java programmer. Uh, it was a high water mark for the company that we actually could find one of these guys and brought him into our company in, in India. And yet he was the sort of guy that says, you know, these new guys coming along, you need to learn it the hard way the same way I do. I'm not going to help you. You need to struggle like I had to struggle. We say, what well, pair program? I don't go do it. But you got to help these guys. You're responsible for the overall delivery. No, I'm not. I get my piece. They get their pieces. That's the way it's got to be. They got to struggle. I'm like, yeah, over my dead body. So I went and grabbed one of my best, best good friends who's actually a superb Java programmer, actually a superb programmer in general. He's a 10x guy. Dropped him into the team. Don't need a title. Doesn't need anything associated with that. He starts pairing with these guys, helping them out. They start delivering like crazy. The senior programmer's looking over there like with these mean eyes. It's like, what you are doing? You can't do that. I'm the senior guy. Doesn't matter. He, we're ignoring him. Stalin strategy. So actually what happened in this case, he eventually quit. The only regret we had was we should have fired him. That was the only regret the management had. So basically, again, bring a new guy in, add him to the team. He will absorb the power necessary. Power is something teams give you. It's not imbued by your title. It's something teams will imbue to you directly. You want to take advantage of that. So again, I can get rid of one active saboteur using these techniques. Change agents. Change agents are sort of the guy coming in and doing this stuff. And Will Mack and Jones always talk about this in their book called Lean Thinking, which has nothing to do with programming. It has to do with the agile processes in general, just in time. And they have a little footnote around page 100 that says, oh, by the way, in order to be effective as a change agent, you have to be a tyrant. Now, you're a benevolent tyrant, but the footnote is tyrants are always shot. So as a change agent, you've got to realize you have short tenure. Your job is to get the change in place and then realize you're going to get shot. So again, how does this look? Well, again, you start out as a change agent. There's an executive, and you come in there, and you have that conversation with the executive, setting the expectations of what's going to happen. Sandwich strategy again. And then basically, you're going to go into the team and drop yourself into one of these teams and start the transformation at the team level. Now, gradually, initially, there's going to be a lot of skepticism over, over this process. It's so strange. It wasn't taught at university. We're doing things they have never seen before at a pace they've never seen before. And even going through the training associated with this sort of technique, they come out of the training and say, yeah, it's really nice for these training exercises. But in the real world, yeah, it turns out in the real world, it also works. So gradually, you begin to come, become you know, imbued of that. But you're going to have a couple of guys who are just not quite there yet. They're kind of not liking what they're seeing. Loss of power or something else is going on. And then over time, when the other team starts to gel, this guy is actually becoming actively hostile with the environment and starting to influence his colleagues as well. And in fact, the change agents become sort of the pariah as far as he's concerned. That this is a, a lightning rod for that counterculture. And how do you kill the counterculture? You walk away. So again, I was working in India. Um, I didn't know how long I was going to be in India, but I needed to basically do a major transformation in the organization. Tyrant. And so I was running around doing things that they didn't like. In fact, every, about every two weeks, I'd get a call from the, from the president of the company saying, Fred, I'm calling you up to yell at you again because you've upset your Indian colleagues. Yeah, I did, yes. And he closed the conversation with saying, keep doing it. So I reached a point where basically I knew that it was time to walk away. There was a counterculture forming uh, that was basically anti-Fred. And so I, I caught, when I had that conversation with him, I said, it's time for me to go. Oh, no, no, you're too important to the, com to the project. A month later, we have the conversation. You need to go. Yes, I told you that two months ago. I'm on the ground here. And I left. Went to do something else. Actually went to China then. Um, so pulling yourself out of this, change agents will be shot. So if you don't want to be the change agent yourself, hire somebody to be the change agent, to take all the slings and arrows of fortune. I guarantee you bring in a real change agent, you look very reasonable compared to them. So when they walk away, you can so easily say, oh, but we can, we'll adopt these sort of things, and it works really well. But let somebody else get shot. You don't need to be the person. Unless you're willing to be the change agent. 
But then realize you go to kind of find yourself another team in about six months. So that's the change agent strategy. So that's sort of the active saboteurs we've talked about. But there's also organizational sabotage going on as well. This has to do with the organization and the impact we're having with this really fast cycle times and this ability to constantly deliver. This is stressing that organization in several different ways. So this first of all, what I call success conservatism. And this is really irritating to me. It says we go in there, we make a really high performing team. And then the product owner says, stop making changes. This is my team. We can't do anything else with this team. Stop your process. And oh, by the way, part of the process is you keep feeding new people into the organization, getting them imbued with the concepts, and then you send them back off to their projects. We'll stop doing that as well. In fact, is there, I don't want to help that other project. That's his problem. I've got my problem solved. Stop making changes. So I saw this happen when I was working in Norway at the Norwegian Welfare Association. So I'm there. Uh, we, in fact, start up the project like we talked about. We spin a team off about two months that a really competent three or four guys going off on their own, replicating the process, working really well. In fact, when the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden our unemployment, unemployment claims are going from a few hundred a day to several thousand a day, we cannot handle the load. So part of that team we spun off, they go basically go off and, in, and basically in four days write a new system to handle the situation. Four days. Perfect example of spinning off a team. How many more times did we spin, the, spin off a team in the next eight months? Zero. Zero. Success conservatism. They didn't let the engine do the job they could have done. They locked it down. Titles. I would say the thing that most irritates me when I come to an organization and they tell me why it can't work is because people have titles. And titles are usually tied to phases of a waterfall process. And contracts are written around these titles. And so you can't do something sort of against these titles because their contract says this. It also sort of, now, now you create basically high handoffs between these phases. We can't afford the handoffs. We're going too fast. That's why full stack developers make a lot of sense. And with the same little team of working, you do the front end, the back end, the database layouts, integration with the front end, all that other stuff needs to be done by one team. So basically, these titles begin to inhibit the concept of a full stack developer. So I ran across this problem when I was working in London at one of the large media companies there, the largest online newspaper in the world in particular. And what I found when I showed up was we had 50 IT professionals in that group. We had 25 titles. And there were zero people to understand what we were trying to accomplish. In fact, the poor scrum master was at the card wall every morning trying to go through stand-ups, and she wasn't technical, trying to figure out is the project going to finish or not. And she's not capable of doing that from the information she has at hand. It's a losing situation. So I was brought in, quote, as the chief architect. The architecture was fine. What I needed to do was change how they thought about themselves and how they organized themselves. That was, the that was basically the inhibitor here. So basically, we uh, decided it was a two-step process. First of all, we gotta got fix the titles. So we defined a model that says, let's talk about your competency and things we care about. So we built ourselves a three-tier model. It could be four, it could be five, doesn't matter. Just have a model. And we identified what we thought were the key technologies for our enterprise at this point. And we would assess everybody on, that, on this scale about where they fit in those technology competencies. You may know nothing about it. You may be completely ignorant. You may be competent, which we call a journeyman. You could be a wizard. That's the masters. In fact, the masters were responsible for deciding where you fit. This wasn't something done by human resources. So then we went back and said, for the new projects, because I could get away with the EU rules, for the new projects, if you want to work on one of the new projects, these are the titles we're going to have. If you don't want to work on the new project, we got tons of legacy code. You have a job for the next 25 years, don't worry about it. But if you want to work on new things, we want to use these titles. We're going to call you a developer if you're competent in one of our key technologies. You're a graduate developer if you're not. Then why would you want to hire such a person? Maybe you were trying to take somebody else and train them to be an iOS programmer. So in the iOS domain, they would just be a graduate developer, working with people to try to acquire the skills. 
And of course, we had our, our, basically our masters. We called them senior consultants. They were masters in a technology. But here's where we did something different. We also defined ourselves what we called a system developer. Read full stack here. Where you're competent, not expert, competent in three to five of our key technologies. And we told you we would pay you the same as we pay the masters. So you have a choice in your career, which you want to do. We also defined something we called a master developer. He had basically he was a master in two or three or four things. We didn't have any of those guys. That's okay. It's something to aspire to. We would pay those guys a fortune. And basically, we gave everybody a choice. Which path do you want for your career? We're not telling you what you have to be. We're giving you both choices. And if you, were like, you wanted to go to the choice that says, I want to be a full-stack developer, and you wanted to go learn some iOS skills, if the iOS team would have you, you can join the iOS team and get, pick up that skill. We would invest in you to do that. So using this organization, we actually got the code out the door. It took about eight months. But previously to this, two CTOs had tried to do this and were fired for the not being able to pull it off. Third CTO comes in. He's much more uh, concerned about keeping his job. And so we tried something really strange. And this worked actually quite well. Titles are an inhibitor. They say, basically, when you see somebody's title, it tells you what they can't do. If it says manager, you clearly can't think. If you're a business, you won't understand anything about programming. If you're a programmer, you couldn't do anything about leadership. All that's nonsense. You can play more than one role. The title actually constrains what people think about you. Where people sit turns out to be really important. We tend to sit departments together. In fact, we allocate your space. Here's, the, here's where my department's going to go. Here's where your department's going to go, because that makes sense. And of course, you got some EU regulations about how many, how many square feet you can put, how many people you can put in a, in a limited amount of space. You have to spread them out. Well, both of these things hurt communication. So why do you attack that particular one? It turns out you need to really work hard on getting people to sit in the right spot. So first of all, you should not sit in a department together. So it turns out there's three reasons people talk to each other. And this comes basically from uh, Tom Allen. Uh, professor at MIT uh, from the Sloan School of Business. He says there's three reasons people talk to each other. First one is we uh, have the same hobbies, same outside interest. Our kids go to the same daycare. We support the same football team. As a business, we have no control over that. Second reason people talk to each other, they have the same manager. Manager tends to be a communication conduit. And the third reason is this one. The chance of you communicating varies inversely with the square distance between our chairs. So if you and I are working this closely and I double the distance, there's only one chance of four of us talking. Double again, one chance of 16. He's measured the intellectual distance of a staircase. It's 100 meters. Square that number. Those guys might as well be in Bangalore. You're not going to see them. So it turns out where you sit is really important. You want to sit the team together that's working on the same thing. Keep the managers, not trying to screw up the management stuff, but sit them together. Again, when working in NAV in, in Norway, we basically had you know, our space that was legally allowed, and we had basically in the same block of, of office, a little block space here, it was open in the middle. We had our attorney, which was a domain expert. We had our UX guy person. She was right there in the corner. And then the rest of us developers, including sort of the, the project lead sort of person, was all sitting in the room together. Then we had another room with more programmers, and we kind of keep meeting with them in our room. So we had lots of meetings in our room, exceeding the capacity by a large. But we tried to minimize the square distance between our chairs. And if I started having a conversation about something, started drawing on a whiteboard, people could turn around and see that and join the conversation. So it turns out where you sit is really important. So fix it. Uh, by the way, uh, it turns out Zoom rooms, you kind of have uh, equidistant intellectual distances. Everybody's kind of the same distance from each other when you're doing Zoom or one of the other technologies. It's not quite as efficient as actually being in the same room because they can't poke your head up and see somebody that's, that's stuck because they're in their own Zoom room. And nor can they sort of overhear a conversation as much. So it's not quite as efficient as that, but it's not bad. It's way better than having one guy sit over here and another team business unit sit over here, a third one sitting over here, and staircases. 
you're much better off using this sort of technique instead. So where you sit turns out to be very important as well. Oversight. People you need to ask permission of. And organizations love to have this because they think they're in control when software is being developed. They're not. Software is an unpredictable process. You can say all you want to and put all the charts together you want to. It's always going to be an unpredictable process. But they still want to have the review boards, architects, standards. So you know, people would come into your office and come into our team rooms and say, hey, I'm your web services compliant architect. Where's my web service compliance report? I say, come, fine, fine, sit down with us, we'll do it together. Oh, no, I don't do that. Fine, there's the door. You want to run talk to the executive? Sandwich strategy. I got him, I got him pinned. He's either going to come do it with us because he thinks it's important, or we're going to ignore him. So you got to find those guys, and you got to figure out how to ignore them. Kill them off, but make sure you don't have the awareness of them. A lot of companies sort of feel, yeah, we need to do Agile. Well, you could do Agile this way where we basically train our developers and get them through schools and stuff like that, or I just hire a Scrum Master. So I have a company, a client in Germany, who basically said, you know, I don't really want to focus on doing this and invest in the programmers. Instead, I'll just put a Scrum Master in each of my teams. And he will tell you how to work, and you will follow his directions. Yeah, you can imagine how well that's worked. Uh, you just can't hire people to enforce a process. The process has to be imbued with the people themselves. I've seen Agile coaches come in, and as soon as the Agile coach walks out the door, they go back. They don't understand what they're trying to accomplish. They never bought into it. You have to invest in them buying into it. We do that with our processes. Finally, there's a reluctance to invest in your contractors. A lot of organizations have contractors. I'm willing to train my own people, and I'm not going to train the contractors. But are, is it, are they important to your success? Yes, but I'm not going to train them. They should already know this stuff. The problem is they don't know this stuff, or else you wouldn't need us. You would need somebody else to come in there to be a tyrant. They don't know it yet. I worked with a, a large company in uh, one of the big manufacturers in Detroit. Um, they would pay for their contractors to go to these classes. They invested in their people. They didn't care what the badge color was. And frankly, in a project, I don't care what color badge you're wearing. Contractor badge, consultant badge, local badge, I could care less. I'm looking for your talent as an individual, how you contribute to the team, and what you can make happen. There are some other classifications for sabotage. I don't have a lot of time to get into these, but there's ones I would tend to call, I call them social or cultural sabotages, things about the organization itself that sort of inhibit this sort of process. And it's sort of the accidental sabotage. There's a lot of cases where people are accidentally sabotaging, but, not, but completely in ignorance. They're not trying to sabotage it. They don't know better. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do in this environment is just keep everybody informed of what's going on. But I'll talk a little more about that later. One of the things I've been playing with more lately, lately in fact, I've been talking about this basically for 15 years, um, is using a pod as a as sort of a mitigation strategy. That when you engage with a client, you want to think about bringing a pod to the table to help do these transformation aspects. And by pod, I mean sort of the skills associated with that. Um, and by the way, my, the consultant company I work with in Norway, Cynthia, has as a core strategy our goal is to enhance the software delivery capabilities of our customers. Not just write the software for them, help them be better themselves. That's why I'm associated with them, because I like that philosophy. All right, so let's talk about what a pod is. First of all, you have people that can look at the problem they're trying to solve and figure out what's going on. What type of model do you Is it a fuzzy problem for the sort of Kinefin model? Is it, is it a very is it a more traditional problem? What type of problem are you trying to solve? Don't tell me we're doing microservices. That's the solution. Let's see what type of problem you're trying to solve first. Let's understand that. We definitely want to talk to the executive, again, sandwich strategy, to make sure they're on board with what we're trying to accomplish. And basically, we want to you know, go to the application architecture. We'll do training as necessary, um, provide the technical leadership until they can develop their own. We'll do some process tuning associated with that, sometimes introducing processes, and basically get the metrics in put in place. That's the pod. The client is going to provide complementary skills. The client understands how to do deployment. The client understands what compliance means in their company. The client understands uh, 
the domain themselves. I need that expertise as well. So with the pod and these sort of corresponding resources, we have an effective team that can make the changes. And then we do a focused engagement. It's a relatively short engagement. It doesn't take very long to get this process started. I want to sort of skip to that. So we're working with a company called Orange Software. Um, they're sort of a conglomerate of a lot of tools associated with running buildings, energy meters, space allocation, uh, that sort of thing. So it's been basically an eight-week engagement. Uh, I had a lot of talks with executives before it started, including some presentations to the overall staff about what's going to happen to make sure everybody's kind of on board that this is coming. Because once you start down this process with your programmers, you can't go back. They'll quit. They're having too much fun. And we helped to sort of give them criteria for finding the initial participants. And they did put together a nice team for us to work with. And finally, they had to go to the board to get approval. So now I got approval at the board level. So anybody wants to get in my way, I say, go talk to the board. I'm ignoring you. Good luck with that. So I've got that power we need. So we basically put together an eight-week timeline. It was all fixed price for the first five weeks because we don't know what's going to happen either. It's, it's, it's a very fuzzy, fuzzy situation. But we think we can have an impact in five weeks. So in this case, we did some training there. We, did, we helped them create the initial stories and some of those other aspects. And then we had three more weeks to sort of continue doing this, but this was on a time and materials basis. So the training took six days. Uh, we, we did normal sort of training associated with, with Agile processes, and we also did training around microservices, because it turns out they're working in a fuzzy problem. And microservices are very powerful for that sort of problem. We also got our first domain briefing about what, domain, what the domain is all about on the first day. That was enough for us to set the architecture. We knew what the application architecture we wanted to use from just that first half-day briefing. We started writing stories around that domain around that point in time. In between there, we started basically building the infrastructure we needed to, in order to implement that solution. Then we started doing development on it. Uh, right now, we're actually at that first, what color is it? First sort of salmon spot. That's the first, oh, where we are now. We're at week five of this project. So we already got code running. We basically have, uh, we got the microservices built. We actually have our first uh, completed story. We're demonstrating it to the client. So we're now off and running. In parallel to that, we're actually going to do another project, just to show that this technique works for more than one project. And this is more of a traditional architecture versus a microservices architecture. So again, we're exploring that it works in both those environments. The briefing occurred at that point. It was actually last Monday, a week ago, we had that briefing. Um, we're doing mob programming initially, because mob programming means everybody gets to understand the process immediately. And then we start rolling into the main stories. So now we're starting that process, and we'll wrap that up. Uh, we'll, we'll continue running that process until they hit their summer break. Meanwhile, we also plan some more experiments. We're not, we're not, I'm not afraid to make running experiments here. We actually added new programmers into the middle of the process, knowing that because they'll absorb it from their colleagues, where we're doing pair programming and rotation of pairs and some of the mobbing. Again, speculation on behalf of the executives was that will never work. It's working fine. In fact, it's working so fine, we've done it again. <laughs> and it's some more people. So now I've got 18 people in my stand-ups working on two different projects, coming from lots of different disciplines. Again, working fine. So to wrap up, let's talk about some of the overall mitigation techniques I've used in this place. So one of the ones you've seen so far, the pod is very powerful. One of the things that's really powerful is label what you're doing as an experiment. Don't say we're going to do this forever. People will get all upset. We're going to run an experiment. When they object to an experiment, they look really unreasonable. Stalin again. <laughs> and so they can't argue with an experiment. We're not saying we've got to do this forever. Let's just try and see what happens. Oh, we don't want to try it. Boy, that looks really unreasonable. You win those arguments. Call things experiments. Keep the executive involved. Just the initial thing is fine, but you've got to keep them involved. They've got to understand what's going on because there will be more noise coming up all the time. You've got to keep that executive understanding what's happening. Bring them to the showcases. Find the sources of fear in the organization. It can be an entire talk just finding fear in the organization and how you stomp it out. But fear is holding back innovation. Find the sources of fear. Is it estimating? Is it commitments? Is it deadlines? Find those and fix those problems. 
keep, the business, keep your team away from the chaos of everyday business. The business is always asking, what if you try this? What if you try this? What if you try this? You got to keep that away from the programmers. They don't need to hear that nonsense. You got to stick to what you have, we call in IBM, the plan of record. So hide some of that nonsense from them as well. And then practice what I call agile schizophrenia. There's a whole presentation about that. If you're doing agile the same way in each of your teams, you're not doing agile. Agile should be different for every team and every project. They're all different. They're running at different paces and they need different helps. So if you have a universal agile process, you've actually screwed yourself as an organization. Agile schizophrenia. And finally, basically, don't try to convince people by putting white papers out there and making presentations like this. Point them to people who have done it. CIOs do not listen to white papers. They listen to other CIOs. Developers listen to other developers that are in this process. Use them as your vehicle to, to convince people. And I'm way out of time. Um, all right, thank you.